Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our panel this morning. Uh, I'm Kimberly Kelsey with Jacobs, and I, with my colleague Kelsey Hu, will be uh, moderating, moderating this panel with a, a group of wonderful women. So we'll start out with Pamela Randolph, who is with the city of Edmonds. She's a visionary in her field. She's focused on efficient operations, ratepayer value, and positioning the city for the future, all while providing career growth opportunities for her staff. She's served on the PNCWA Leadership Committee and as both a formal and informal mentor. Pamela is a licensed operator with several years of experience in wastewater treatment operations and maintenance. Kelsey? Yeah, so I get the pleasure of introducing Lorraine Patterson as Chief Administrative Officer for King County's Department of Natural Resources and Parks. Lorraine is never bored and often engaged in very different topics throughout the day. A day might include a briefing on human resources issues, conversations with finance managers on budgets or funding issues, strategy development around equity or other long-term goals and fun topics like space planning. Lorraine is a licensed attorney with experience in employment and labor relations. She utilizes managerial courage and continuous improvement to ensure results while developing staff to achieve their personal goals. As a lifelong resident of the Pacific Northwest, she has had many opportunities to enjoy the jewels that are abundant in our region. She strongly believes in the efforts required to maintain and or restore our natural areas for future generations. I also am get the pleasure of um, introducing Hilma Jimenez. Hilma manages business operations for the Northwest geography at, at Jacobs, including Washington, Hawaii, Alaska, Oregon, Idaho, North and South Dakota, and Montana. She's also a valued global leader in our Together Beyond journey, which is Jacobs' approach to living inclusion every day and enabling diversity and equality globally. Hilma brings more than 25 years of experience managing complex teams and engineering projects and is a civil and mechanical licensed professional engineer. And I just want to make a note. We were hoping that our other colleague, Cheryl Doran, was going to be able to join us this morning, but for personal reasons, she is she's unable to be part of the panel. So we will try to incorporate her next time. Uh, so with that, I want to give each of our panelists a couple of minutes to just um, tell us about their leadership path. And we'll start with Pamela. We kind of know we want to know how you got to where you are today. Okay, hey, um, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate today. Um, I started my career a few years ago in the Water and Wastewater Technical School. <laughs> and um, from there, I, I worked with the city of Portland, Oregon, um, with uh, King County, with the city of Tacoma, and now I'm with Edmonds. And through that career path, I did have a good foundation in water and wastewater, but through the years, I realized that there were some things that I was missing. So I went back to school and I um, took a business degree and also a human resources degree. And I've been trying to um, blend those together for um, a leadership um, position. And I think um, that's one of the, the, the things I think that, that I've relied on mostly is the foundational training that I've had in the water and wastewater industry. And then again, the continued education. I'm, I'm really big on continuing education for, for staff and, and um, yeah. okay. Thank you, Pamela. Lorraine, would you please go next? Absolutely. Uh, so I've had an odd path of getting to where I'm at today um, because I came to the county over 18 years ago, something like that, um, as a lawyer. And I came in through human resources, so Pamela, uh, and spent some time in the transit division. And one of the things I think I did that was a little different is I built a lot of partnerships with leaders to get them to move in the direction that we wanted to move, um, to create a culture that actually was going to lead to better employee engagement. And that led to being promoted up within human resources. Uh, finally, I was the HR manager for the Department of Transportation, and I was asked to move over to wastewater and to become, to become their deputy director. And part of that path was really um, trying to influence the culture around employee relations, labor relations. We were just having, we were having some challenges in that area. So putting a leader in place with an HR background of uh, 
was thought to be a successful way of moving moving the organization, and I think it it worked. And but I didn't have a water background. I wasn't an engineer or any or I hadn't worked in wastewater before, so I had a lot to learn about about that industry, and I loved it. And so I was with the wastewater group, our wastewater treatment division, for uh, five years. And then eventually came back to the county in this role where I continue to work with wastewater, uh, storm water, all kinds of our, our water things in the Department of Natural Resources and Parks um, as their CAO, Chief Administrative Officer. Um, but I think it's that, that background of actually partnering with leaders to really invest in the culture uh, that got me to where I am today. Thank you. Hilma, will you please tell us about your career path? Well, I think uh, uh, I'll start off by saying this. Uh, my auntie tells me all the time that life is what happens after you've made plans. And uh, uh, I wish I could tell you that I had it all figured out, but I did not. I think that I started off my background, you know, as a junior engineer working for King County. And so I worked in the public sector uh, for a number of years. And, uh, but I felt curious. I wanted to know how the sausage was really made. Having actually led teams of consultants, I wanted to become one. And so after a number of years working with the county, I decided to come become a consultant. And I, that was such an eye-opening idea for me, an uh, experience for me, um, learning what it took to produce an actual job. And though I designed stuff when I was working as a junior engineer for King County, I was just so totally floored by the amount of effort it took to meet a promise because as consultants, that's all we do. We sell promises. I had a, one of my me mentors said that to me all the time. All we do is sell promises. And so I realized early on that in order to meet these promises, you needed to have an understanding of really what the client needed. You needed to empower your teams and you needed to go to bat for them as well and always deliver and not only deliver on time, but deliver uh, quality products. And so it was that uh, idea of figuring out what the problem is and coming up with a vision and partnering with people uh, that eventually um, allowed me, opened up doors for me to continue to grow in management uh, and, and in taking on leadership of larger and larger teams. And, and so, and that's what got me to where I'm at today. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting story. So we'll move on to um, our next question here, and we'll start with Pamela. Pamela, how did you navigate turning points along your leadership path? Okay, yeah, navigating turning points along uh, my leadership path. I've, um, I was uh, one of these uh, a person that, that started at, at the bottom. I started at the utility worker level and I worked my way up through to leadership positions. And one of the things that I did early on was to set a goal. And I did things that kept moving me towards that goal. No matter what happened, I would find a different way to achieve it. When an opportunity came up for a training course, I would take it. When an opportunity or when, when a, a barrier hit, hit, I would look for another way, but I always kept focused on, on the goal. So the turning points um, were when I realized I needed to broaden my, again, I, I keep going back to education because I think that's so important. I went back and I, I realized what, is, what would set me apart from the other people in my industry and how might I have that one more skill or value that, that, that maybe someone else doesn't have? And so that's why I took these other opportunities. So I believe those were turning points in my career. And at one point I um, decided that I was, had been with King County for a long time and it was a wonderful opportunity and I, just a wealth of experience and opportunity that I gained there but I felt like I needed to break out and go to another location to try some of these skills that I had learned. And I, I did that when I, when I stepped into the Tacoma, um, city of Tacoma position. And then another turning point was when I had the opportunity to come to Edmonds and Edmonds has allowed me to, to, um, 
to be more involved in the in the daily decisions in the direction. And that's allowed me to really, I believe, I, I think, I, I don't know if, I, if this is the right term, but to come into my own, to be more of a visionary on how can we really achieve these environmental goals and things that we've, that I've, and, and to experience or to, to, to practice the things that I've learned. So I think, um, you know, just taking opportunities when, when walls hit, look for another way around, different way up the mountain, if you will. Thank you, Pamela. Um, Hilma, same question. How did you navigate turning points along your leadership path? Well, I mean, again, I, I wish I knew that they were turning points at the moment. I did not. But I would say in, in hindsight, I would say three things, flexibility, curiosity, and courage. Uh, very similar to what Pamela was talking about in terms of uh, expanding her horizons and uh, a, a greater vision. I should say background wise, um, my undergraduate degree was actually in uh, general engineering with a mechanical engineering concentration. And I, I started actually doing mechanical HVAC work uh, but then I had an opportunity of starting working in civil engineering and learning water. And that was, I was like, oh, okay, okay, well, I'll just do it. It was just that, that flexibility and not casting my net too small and the curiosity of saying, hey, you know what? I can apply these skills to, to anything, right? Uh, and then I would say courage because, you know, at, at the given moment, I did not know what, was going to, what it was going to lead to, and I didn't have it all figured out in my mind. So it was important for me to fight against the imposter syndrome, the imposter syndrome, which affects so many of us, particularly women, thinking, oh, sorry about my phone there, my phone in the background. But, um, but this whole idea that you have to have it all figured out before you get to do it, it was just actually holding on to a little bit of courage uh, and saying, hey, you know what? I have proven myself before. I can do it again, and um, and and that really opened up a lot of doors for me. Thank you, Helma uh, and Lorraine. Well, like I, I'm not going to say anything new because I think that what Pamela and Helma have said are really the path forward. Um, but being uncom being okay with being uncomfortable, and being willing to put yourself out there when people ask you to do something, being just saying yes just saying yes, um, because it usually leads to something really great or a great learning. Um, and I think that what Pamela was uh, emphasizing about education, uh, whether I was taking an asset management class with a bunch of wastewater operators, or I was at the Evans School doing an executive management program, like all of those things were things that built a path forward. And I was always looking for an opportunity to learn, to learn more. Um, but some of the things that you'll be asked will make you uncomfortable and you just have to push forward and just do it because uh, on the other side, good things, good things will come. Thank you very much. You. Yeah, that's, it's really comforting to hear that you don't have to have a perfect plan forward as you start trying to think like, what am I even doing tomorrow, <laughs> let alone five years from now or 10 years from now. Um, so I really appreciate all of your insights on that. So shifting gears a little bit here, um, what do you think it takes to be a successful woman in our industry? And Pamela, I wanna pass on this one off to you first and kind of thinking about has that definition of success changed over time or what are your thoughts? Well, um, what does it take to be a successful woman in the industry and has that changed? Um, my definition of success has changed um, since I first started. It, at first, it was to be um, in, in this position or that position. And I, I, I did everything to, to get to the next place. And now I feel like, OK, I got where I wanted to be. So, so now what? So the definition of success is changed for me in that I'm more interested in building a team and being engaged and seeing other people being um, more successful or being successful and when I say successful it's what how they define it as successful and I think that um I think that um that's hard sometimes 
I see that people can be something and I see something that, that I really think they can do this and it might not be what they want to do. So it's really about listening to other people and building that team and, and, and developing um, our city resources and, and utilizing those successfully. So I think that my, my, my view of success is different today than it was when I first started. And it was always to achieve a position, but now when I'm at this position, it's to achieve the things that I can I can focus on or the things that I can affect. So um, if if that, I mean, that's my answer. <laughs> I, 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 I get a little bit um, challenged with those types of questions because every day is sort of a little different. Um, I'm challenged today um, with this panel. I mean, these are wonderfully smart, brilliant women here talking. And is this successful that I'm here? I don't know. And I think it goes back to that imposter syndrome. So there you go. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Um, and Hilda and Lorraine, if you'd like to add, uh, go for it. Otherwise, Helma, I'd be curious um, if you have any stories or anecdotes about how another woman leader might have positively impacted your progression. Wow, that 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 is a great question. You know, I think um, I do. My very first job I got um, because of a woman, uh, and she was um, a, a manager, a pretty high level manager at King County. And I was just graduating from college. And she said, hey, you know what? We, we got an internship that you, that you should consider. And she opened up the doors for me. Um, and so I, my career has been impacted from women uh, from the jump start, just looking at the progression of the work that my mother and my grandmother who started with way less than what I had and how they impacted me just gave me a sense of wanting to do more. Um, and um, I would say, but particularly coming to this whole industry as a black Hispanic woman uh, that's an immigrant with an accent in a predominantly wild a male white white male dominated field uh, has been a challenge and and i think to a certain extent at the beginning i wanted to not draw attention to myself i wanted to blend it into the walls as though i could like if i really could um i wanted to be just like them um and and i think sometimes when you find yourself in that position you you try to shun from associating with other women but eventually, once I dropped that and decided I was going to be the best woman, not the best man I could be, but the best woman that I could be, um, and I started embracing the sisterhood that it is uh, of working with other women. And boy, today I have a network of women that some I work with, some I don't work with, um, some are in the field and some are in the other fields. But they just bring such wisdom and and it's like my sounding board for issues and i i call them up i still call back that same lady who who gave me my first job and i i was talk, just talking to her i call her auntie I, I i said auntie i'm going through this issue and she's like well that they wouldn't have told a man that consider it this way this is what you should do when i had this issue happen to me 30 years ago this is what i did and so being able to uh, to learn from their experiences is just so important. So I come today to this conversation with, um, you know, an understanding of the fact that I did not get here by myself, that there are other women who propelled me to this point, and with a sense of responsibility then uh, to do the same for the next generation. Great, thank you. I think you actually just touched on what I was just about to think about answering, asking this next question. And actually, Pamela and Lorraine, I'm curious on your perspective on this. What are some of the barriers you see to entering and staying in this industry? Ooh. Entering, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. A bunch of years ago, you know, it was very difficult to, um, I think one of the things about the industry is a long time ago, the, the pay and the, and the resources 
you know, for people that wanted to come into this industry, they just weren't there. And so now we've spent a lot of years trying to make this a profession. And I'm speaking more of the more towards the operations end of things. And so now what's happened is, and, and, and we've really pushed education and we haven't really pushed, you know, technical fields and things. So I think a big barrier to our industry right now is the entry level. We cannot attract entry level people into our industry because of the barrier to entry. We've, we've built this profession and we've required education, we've required experience, but the problem is, is you can't start unless you have an operator certificate. You have an entry level, you have a certain experience, but we've we've destroyed those in this in the um, education system. So I think we really need to get back to doing um, te pushing technical schools and pushing entry level positions. So for example, the city of Edmonds, we've got 16 people. I can't really, I don't really have positions for entry level. I know uh, like King County has done a lot to get entry level people in, but that barrier is you have to have licenses and you have to have educational skills to be able to move through. And um, I just see that as, as one of our biggest challenges right now. You know, when you open up positions and you, you can't get qualified applicants because you know, of the basic skills that we need, it's a challenge. And I just see that more and more. So I, I think that's a, a barrier to the entry in, into the field. I, I think I would talk about how to retain people because um, like Pamela said, we are, we've developed an, operator training programs so that you can have no experience and come in and gain your and, and gain that experience and get your license. So we are getting people off the street. Uh, but how do we keep women, uh, people of color in the industry? And one of the challenges is that they're still working with a uh, predominantly white male uh, workforce. And so uh, I have had times where women are not heard and they're not seen as valued when they have a different opinion than maybe their supervisors or operations leads might have. And so supporting them in their current positions and letting them understand that there are people who will help them um, is really important. And it's just really getting, getting to them. But that is the biggest barrier right now to retaining great women that we may actually bring on board is making sure they see they see themselves as valued because there are other places they can work and they don't have to work uh, for for King County um, or other organizations. So to retain them, we, we have to show them that we really want them there and that there's a path forward uh, for them to grow in our in our organization. I might like to add one thing to what you what you're saying there, Lorraine, is it's very important that when we do finally get women attracted and, and diversity attracted, that we help them be successful. And, and I think that that's where the mentoring programs really can come in. I just recall being in so many programs where my male counterparts, you could ask them who their mentor was and it was easy to find, oh, he's my mentor. He, you know, And they would clearly define them. I'm like, well, I'm looking around, where's my mentor? Well, there wasn't one. You know, So I think it's really important that we give that support. And even if that mentor happens to be in another organization, we need to do a better job of, of, um, of, of tagging people up and helping to find people that can help them be successful to be that sounding board, if you will. I, th I think that's a really good point um, because right now you have to ask for a mentor, right? And, and instead of us just budding somebody up, knowing that they're, that they're alone out there, um, actually being proactive and giving them somebody that they can rely on, I think would be a better, better approach. Mentoring is such an important thing. Um, I'm a complete advocate of if you want one, go find one and just say, hey, will you please have coffee with me? Uh, I'd like to talk with you. Um, thank you. So I just want to mention that we have a couple more questions here and then we'll jump to the, the chat questions. So if you if you do have questions for our panel, please, please start loading up the chat. Um, Lorraine, I'd like to direct this one to you. Okay. What is one thing in the industry you wish you would change? And how are you helping drive that change? I guess the biggest thing that I wish would change is I wish that the regular public understood how valuable our work, our work really is for the environment. 
Um, people don't know what wastewater, stormwater, the clean water efforts that are happening and all of these different locations um, across the country, just how valuable that work, work is to their own environment, to their own um, enjoyment of the environment. And so I think we would get a lot more uh, young people, uh, people changing careers, actually moving towards us if they understood what we were what we were doing. So some of what we're trying to do to change that is to be more proactive in our communication so that people really start to link up like that really great stream that you like wading through. It's that way because of work that's happening upstream or downstream. So wherever we happen to be positioned, it's to make it fun, to make it enjoyable, to see themselves in the work that we're, work that we're doing. Um, we're trying to be more proactive because we have to build the future and, and it can't be just the entry level programs because we need people coming into our organization at all different levels and they have to know we're here. Thank you. Emma or Pamela, anything to add to that one? No, I, I actually really like what, what Lorraine was saying. I think that, you know, growing up, I had no idea what wastewater meant. Like, you know, I'm still learning it today because I came through um, um, as some other segments of our industry, but it's just this whole idea of having those conversations with young women and young people and, and telling them the boring detail of what you do. Uh, uh, talking to our kids, uh, talking to our nieces and nephews about it. Um, I think it's it's up to us to do to do that. And also, I would say that then uh, Lorraine also mentioned the the components about retention. Uh, and one of the things we've learned um, as a company, Jacobs, and particularly in our, on our journey of what we call Together Beyond uh, within Jacobs of inclusion of diversity, we've learned that innovation comes through diversity, right? We want to have everybody's voices there, but not just allowed to speak, but welcome to speak. That's a different thing altogether for people to feel like they can actually raise their hand and their voice is not only gonna be recognized, but acknowledge and, and want uh, to have your opinions. It's so important for the retention component. What we've seen in our industry is, is that a lot of women are opting out, even after having gotten degree, degrees and the education, um, you know, they come into the workforce, they work for a few years, they start off their families, and then they opt out of coming back, right? We want, uh, we want to make sure that, um, that that's not the case, that they feel they belong, that, they, that their seat is an important seat within our industry. And... Uh, and because we rely on the voices of the many different people, women, men, all ethnicities, genders, uh, in order to bring about that component of innovation. And the reason inclusion is so important is because when people don't feel included, they're spending their time trying to fit in. That's where their energy is going towards. And what we're trying to do at Jacobs is make sure we're harnessing that energy to innovation and not into fitting into a group. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and perfect timing actually, it's hard to um, talk about or be in this virtual panel situation and not have a question about COVID and how do we stay connected in this kind of digital world. And I think the other part of as we're continuing to learn and operate in this way, um, how can we not only survive, but actually thrive through big changes, and be resilient? So Hilma or Lorraine or Pamela, any of you can take a crack at that one. I, I'm happy to kick, to kick us off. Uh, we made the decision as a department that we will never go back to offices in downtown Seattle. So 860 employees who are currently uh, remote working will continue doing that uh, after the pandemic ends, which is really, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big change because most people are thinking that they'll go back at least part-time, part but none of our employees will, 
uh, will go back. So that's a big change that was started because of because of COVID. But what we're trying to do to keep connections, and we did a little bit of this this summer, uh, despite the pandemic, and I hopefully we'll do more at, in the upcoming summer, is really pushing our parks and that people can meet differently. So instead of what you would have done in a downtown office in Seattle, that you meet with your coworkers and socially distance and you're together in a, in a park, you're together outside. We're also hoping that by not centering people in downtown Seattle, that they actually connect more with our employees who are out in the field. So if you need to have a meeting at a plant, that meeting happens at a plant and you don't ask plant people to come downtown for a meeting. You go to where the work is actually actually delivered. And we're hoping that that will actually build more community because now everything is not this central downtown and it's the, out, the downtown people versus the um, uh, people working in the field, uh, we're all in the field you know, together. So, so it's an experiment, and we will see we will see how it goes. Um, and it's a huge change, and it's a big culture change uh, that we are working our way through. I think for for um, for us, we're a smaller organization, and and we don't really um, have the the luxury that that some um, departments do for working from home. Most of our people have to be on site. So we have done some unique things, changing schedules, giving a little bit more flexibility. We've spread our teams out a little bit more. And that has allowed for the people who typically work by themselves to actually have someone else available or close to them. I make a point to call people on the weekends, on their off shifts, the swings and the, and the, and the weekend workers, just to connect with them, to make sure that they're tied into what's going on. And we do have um, periodic meetings. We've, we've done the Zoom meeting so that everybody can, can work together. This week is actually one of our first training sessions that we're gonna be doing all together. So we're gonna see how that works. Certainly we're, we're distanced and, and um, we're following all of our COVID guidelines, but it has been difficult. Um, touching base with our um, partners, treatment plant partners. And it's, you know, we're, I used to be a phone call. Now we're doing a Zoom call. Um, but I think it's, it's just important to make sure that we're connecting, whether it's the phone or the, or the Zoom call on a routine basis with all the members of our team and not to just forget that, oh, the swing shift guy's out here and, you know, nobody's invited him to you know, to participate in a discussion for a while. So it's it's just part of, I think, my job to make sure that we're including everybody and they have a voice as we go forward. Yeah, those are great points. I, I would say we are in a, an international organization. And uh, one of the things that COVID has done for us is really connected us to some of our partners who are in different parts of the world. Uh, we could not have dreamt of having an expert uh, in this one field or in this one particular area come to a meeting, but now we can. Now we can just uh, and have them be engaged in a similar manner as, as somebody who lives maybe uh, 15 miles down the road from the office. So we are looking forward to tapping into that and being able to then provide more of those experts to our clients in the delivery of our services. When it comes to our individual teams, what we've also found uh, is, is that COVID has provided for many of us a lot more flexibility uh, than what we had before. Uh, I typically hear people who go uh, and walk their dogs in the middle of the day because they have half an hour uh, in the middle of the day and they're able to enjoy that because then they're gonna work a little bit longer. We want to continue to encourage that kind of flexibility within our teams. On the downside, what we have found so far uh, where it comes to uh, with the COVID situation, which I think it's different than how it's going to be in the future, is the fact that some people can get lost, right? It's very easy to join a Zoom meeting. You see the person's name on there. They don't say anything. Their camera doesn't get turned on. And they're almost like voyeurs, you know, like they're peeping into a meeting, uh, but they're not participating. So we have been intentionally uh, conducting different things. We've, we've enacted different programs, but one in particular, we're calling them engagement interviews, where we're asking all people leaders to contact all of their staff on a regular basis and having these conversations about 
where they are regarding their positive mental health, because why aren't we hearing from me? We want to make sure that we are being our brother's keepers where it comes to uh, how they're feeling emotionally. And then also understanding their outlook, having making sure that they are not getting lost in the meetings, that their voices are being heard, and that we are sharing with them career tracks and paths for them so that they can continue to be part uh, of the overall organization. So we're very actively engaged in this. And, and one of the messages that we're making to our staff is, is that we have also decided that we will never go back to the office the way that we used to and having, you know, a, at least in this area, 400 people in Bellevue, uh, we've actually cut down on the square footage of our, of our offices. But we use our offices, we hope to use our offices for collaboration settings. So some, the flexibility between some at home work and some in office work, which will be different than now. Now you just feel so restrained because you cannot engage with people. Uh, that is going to really change for us. Okay, hey, um, I think we're gonna try to jump to some of the questions from the audience now. There's a nice um, natural segue here. Um, so we'll start with this one and then we'll go to the top of the list as, as they've come into the chat. So um, I think Lorraine, I'd like to direct this one to you um, to start. And it's, do you have any additional comments about how COVID is changing the work environment and career paths specifically for women? So I, I think my, my comment would be that it may be more difficult, right? Because if you're not, uh, for example, in my situation, with all of us not being in the office, it's a lot harder to be seen. And so we have to be more intentional about connecting people, about senior leaders being able to see people within our organization and getting people out. And not all leaders are great at that. And so what we've done is we've charged our human resources group to actually pay attention to what's really happening with our, with our leaders because we have a feeling of who performs well in this area with employee engagement and who doesn't. And we do, and we do these surveys every year where employees can tell us how things, are, how things are going. So it's up to us to keep our eyes on that and to really lift people up. It's also important that uh, women and others not hide, right? You speak up for yourself, stand up. Um, I saw something pop up about like, what would you tell your younger self, which you'll probably get to, sorry. But, but it's it would be like, you, you have to stand up for yourself and don't be afraid of the limelight, right? Like, be seen and don't give all of your good ideas to somebody else to move, to move them forward. You have to make yourself uncomfortable. And that um, I think is a, is a theme. And, will become even more important when some of us are working from home and others are others may be in a hybrid situation. Thank you. Anyone else have additional comments on that one? Let's... Yeah, I think I think what we've seen is, is that it's been it, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, uh, we saw that uh, they're giving their caregiving nature uh, a lot of uh, women within our industry and within our, our company were affected, right? Because now not only were they mom, uh, but they were a teacher and they were playmate. And, um, and so it, it has been a challenge for some of the women. Hopefully, again, this is, we, we it, as a company, we provided some resources to help parents uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, that we hope quite a few of them are availing themselves out of. But I would say it's just hold on to that hope that schools hopefully will be reopened soon and it will allow them the flexibility and we'll be able to have a really better understanding of what this next a segment of what the world is gonna look like. It's not gonna be the way it is now. And I would say um, what we are hoping then, then is, is that people are really relying on their connections um, um, and to say it's, I don't feel okay. You know, that whole concept of vulnerability is one that we shy away from, particularly as women, because we don't want to be seen as emotional or whatever. One thing I've learned uh, over the years is that men are more emotional than women. <laughs> like I've really learned that. So don't be afraid 
of sharing your feelings uh, with trusted partners about how you're doing and, and seeking that support and raising your hand and saying, I'm not okay, uh, is gonna be really important for us moving forward. I think I froze. Nope, no, 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 I don't really have anything to add to that question um, about how specifically the COVID has affected women's careers, other than to say that because of the COVID, we haven't been able to have the tours. And we generally partner with the environmental science team from, uh, from Edmonds Community College. And they come in a couple times, I think three times a year, and they do tours. And so we're able to share with um, the, it, it, they're usually very diverse um, classes and we talk a lot about um, what is this career path? What does it look like? We haven't been able to do that. So I'm really worried that we haven't been able to attract some people because of, of this. So I'm really hoping that we'll be able to get back to that. So we're able to share with people entering the workforce and taking those entry level environmental science courses, what is really available in our industry. Great, thank you. So going back up to the top, as uh, we have a couple minutes left here, as Lorraine was pointing out, what could you tell your younger you if you were just starting out in the current environment? And I think actually related to that as well, are there any career rules that you were taught that turned out to not be true? I mean, I would say uh, some of what I've already shared before, uh, you know, I would tell my younger me that um, just be interested in learning. Do wherever you are in whatever situation you're in, try to be a sponge and suck it all in, you know. Um, don't, don't confine yourself to rules and saying, I don't do this and I don't do that. That's beyond my pay grade. I'll share this story. I can, this, is, this will be a fun one for you. Early on in my career, uh, within the first two years, uh, I was transitioned from one job into another one because there were some layoffs at King County. And um, when I got to the new role, and, I and it was an, another engineering team, the manager said to me, oh, here's all this filing I want you to do. And he gave me this huge stack of files that he wanted me to file. And he said, yes, please do this filing because the engineers don't like doing the filing. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm an engineer. But I, I, I took it in stride, I took it in stride. So actually what I did is I, I actually created a big spreadsheet. I actually cross-referenced a whole bunch of stuff. And like I did the very best filing job I possibly could. Then I went and I spoke to his boss and I said, hey, I just want you to know that I'm doing this filing work, but this is what I have done because I assume that if you ask me, an engineer, to do some filing, that you really were looking for something beyond uh, what somebody else could do for you. And so I just took it in stride. I went to lunch. I came back. All the files were gone from my desk. I mean, <laughs> so it was a way of handling the situation without not saying no. Uh, and, and again, just showing up and giving your best self, whatever the circumstances. So, so I'll add that to my, my resume filing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. So what would we tell our younger self? Um, you know, I think the thing that, that I would tell myself is, is don't, don't quit don't let somebody else define my success where I want to be what and, and, and in fact that that happened to me in my first career I didn't go into that in detail after four years of working from uh 1980 to 84 when I was just um younger uh <laughs> I quit I stayed home for four years and then I had the opportunity to um, come back into King County and I decided at that point, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to let these people hold me down and hold me back from what I wanted to achieve. 
so I think that that that's the thing is is fig, is is set your set your goals and and go achieve them and, and don't let anything you know derail you um, from where you want to be or where you what what you think you can and challenge yourself. I think that was in one of the other presentations this morning is always continually challenge yourself and to always be, you know, uh, do better, achieve more, help others. It's always a continuous challenging, um, to, again, to just challenge yourself to achieve more or to, to be able to see things differently and to check your own assumptions. And I think the last thing I think that I would like to tell myself if I was starting over is to always recognize the difference between my intentions and my impact. I think that that's something I wish I had heard a long time ago, because I think that, you know, through the years feeling like I had to, you know, always fight to get where I wanted to be, I came across as, as a way that I wasn't. And I think that that's what I would like to tell myself if I was starting over. That is a wonderful note to end on. Unfortunately, we are out of time. A huge, huge thank you to all of our wonderful panelists uh, for sharing your wisdom. And thank you to everyone in the audience who also had questions. If we didn't get to your question or you were inspired with new questions, uh, you can always join our panelists uh, in breakout room three. But before we get to networking, I'll pass it over to Haley Faulkner to introduce our final speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley Faulkner, and I'm the environmental manager for the city of Boise and the current president of PNCWA. And what a morning. Um, I'm really glad that you are all here and that we're learning together. Um, I'm glad to be in this position of being able to share, but also to have learned um, alongside everyone today. And to the few men that I know are in the audience, uh, thank you. We need you and your voice as well. And I'm really glad that you are here today. Um, before I start and introduce our next speaker, I just wanted to build a little bit on what Lynn had shared this morning. Um, if my math and counting are correct, it took more than 50 years before PNCWA saw their first board president who was a woman. Uh, since then, there have been six and three of those have been in the last 10 years. So a similar trend. I don't think those numbers fully capture the incredible set of leaders that we have though in our organization, in our committees, you all here today, we're grateful for you. And we want to hear your ideas and have your input and have you be a part of building the future of PNCWA. I hope that today you've identified someone that you want to reach out to and connect with or an action that you want to take after this summit. Okay, to the final speaker before our breakout rooms. Uh, the woman I am introducing today is the 2020 uh, PNCWA Woman of the Year, Nora Curtis. Um, this award, just to tell you a little bit about, of it, about it, recognizes women who are members of PNCWA and have excelled in their career, have forwarded water issues, and have made significant achievement in the water industry. The essence of this award is to discover and reward exceptional women for their leadership, mentoring skills, and ideas that stand out from their colleagues. And Nora, who is the Utility Operations and Services Managing Director for Clean Water Services, you know, her nomination stood out for these things, for her leadership and how she serves as a role model for her teams and her support for women in the industry. And a couple notes I pulled out from her nomination are that her constructive leadership style creates authentic dialogue and common purpose in groups with divergent interests. And if that isn't something we could all really strive to be like, and also she's a strong advocate for hiring and promoting women in her organization and for proactively working with the community. And so with those notes, it's my pleasure to introduce Nora Curtis, the 2020 PNCWA Woman of the Year, Nora. Thank you, Haley, for that lovely and really generous introduction. It's, it's my honor and privilege to be in the company of so many wonderful women of water today. I was honored to be considered for the PNCWA 2020 Women of the Year Award, along with many other talented nominees, and then to join the previous recipients, Nikki, Shannon, and Nan, some of the best in our industry. Although the, the Woman of the Year Award is an individual honor, we all know that receiving an individual award is the result of having a strong personal and professional network of leaders and colleagues and friends and family that support you. 
And to all of those people, I'm, I'm in really grateful. As I wind down this part of my career, I actually have uh, just a little over six weeks left. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you about leadership and diversity in the water sector and humbly offer some lessons that I've learned. Looking back over 38 years in this field, I've been very lucky. Um, a dear friend and colleague of mine says that she and I are accidental engineers. Uh, and that was certainly true for me. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college and I went into college literally not even knowing there was such a thing as an engineer other than the kind that wore striped caps and drove trains. I became a civil engineer because after changing my major three times in my freshman year, it was the only engineering program where I could luckily fit in all of the required courses and still finish in four years. So lesson one, never let yourself feel boxed in. There is power in identifying your options and then making choices. After beginning my career in the private sector, uh, working for a multidiscipline architectural and engineering firm, I had the opportunity to work on several types of civil projects, everything from roadways to treatment plants. And I found I really liked the water related ones. And when I exercised my option to move back to California rather than say, stay misplaced in Wisconsin, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to discover joy in working in public sector service on water supply projects and rehabilitation. You know, the invite for today's summit references the, pre the presenter's passion for water. Um, I've never really thought about having a passion for water, but I've always had a relationship with water, a give and take, a symbiosis. I grew up on the peninsula um, between the mighty Pacific Ocean and the San Francisco Bay, delighting in the awesome power of one and the safe harbor of the other. My cousins lived in Santa Cruz, just a few steps from the sea cliff, and my uncle would take us down to the tide pools, and I was amazed at the power of these little puddles to simultaneously support such a complexity of life and then be pounded by massive waves. Um, when my husband and I began rock climbing in Yosemite, I remember hiking up a steep riverbed in the backcountry during the heat of summer. There wasn't a drop of water or a speck of silt in that channel because the granite, been, had been, the granite bed had been polished smooth over eons of fierce winter and spring flows. And 25 years ago this week, I remember the floods of 1996 here in the Northwest. Although the devastation of that water event was tragic, people came together to help protect, rescue, and support their neighbors and communities. So lesson two, women and water, life-giving, powerful, awe-inspiring, unifying. Over 38 years, I've been lucky to work with and for many talented colleagues. Those that I came to admire most came from all walks of life and diverse areas of expertise. These were wise and fair elected officials, engaged community members, thoughtful and caring managers, skilled engineers, gruff contractors, and incredible line workers and technicians with more years of real life work experience than, and skill than I would ever hope to have. Women and men, people who were generous with their time and talent who never asked why I didn't know this or that, and who allowed me to be curious and never stop learning. Lesson three, it's almost always true that there are no dumb questions. In whatever role they held, whether formally recognized or not, they were leaders who led with integrity and compassion. Together, we created powerful, inclusive teams and accomplished great things. 
I have a sign in my office that reads, work hard and be nice. It's been a good credo, and I alternately use it as a memo to self and as a suggestion to other people. My role models taught me that being nice, staying humble, and practicing humility do not make a leader weak. Recognizing that you're not the smartest, most knowledgeable, best suited person for each and every task leads to being willing to ask for help, advice, and input from all corners. And when you do that with a truly nice, open heart and mind, it demonstrates an understanding of every person's value to the hard work that you're doing and the power that is generated through inclusivity. Lesson four, as women of water, wow, we are a powerful force for needed change. We are also one mighty component of a larger people of water. And it is in that people of water equally represented where there is true power. Power to protect our precious natural resources, power to inspire the next generation of leaders, power to work together to overcome technical and societal obstacles, power to lead our communities to a better and brighter future with clean water for all. I really wanna thank you for sharing this day with me and with your other colleagues. I wish you all a happy and healthy 2021 and continued success in this incredible field. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. And at the risk of letting the opportunity pass, that really was powerful. And congratulations on your upcoming retirement. And thank you all for joining us today. These summits certainly would not be a success without your engagement and support. And I hope that you can carry the joy and energy and connection from today with you for a while. A huge thank you again to our gold sponsors, Brown and Caldwell, Carollo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Slayton, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy Jenks. The silver sponsors for today's summits were Parametrics, Marie Smith, Stantec, Aqua Efficiency, and Vaughn Company. And I echo Lynn's sentiment from earlier that that really is an amazing list. Now we have a great opportunity for you to connect again uh, with our speakers. So please join us for a continued Q&A and con conversation. Um, there are three different Zoom rooms, uh, one with Stephanie Smith, one with Nikki Pozos and Jesse Marin, and one with our panelists, Lorraine Patterson, Pamela Randolph, and Hilma Jimenez. The Zoom links should be in the chat. Uh, you can click on the one that you want to go to and it'll bring you to those Q&A. Thank you everyone, have a great day.